get two passages of scripture, get Micah chapter 5, and then get Colossians chapter 1. Now that should ring a bell. <laughs> Okay. Now the passage in Micah is one we'll even refer to the next hour. Um, so but it, it kind of lays the foundation when we do a comparison with Colossians chapter 1. Now the, the passage in Colossians chapter 1, you want to have a marker there in Colossians that we can come back to. But read just to read a couple portions of scripture. Um, if you look at uh, verse 2 of Micah chapter 5, it says, But thou Bethlehem Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth have been from of old, from everlasting. So keep that thought in mind where the Lord Jesus Christ came from. He came from everlasting. And you know, talking about Bethlehem, and that that's where the Lord Jesus Christ is coming from, as the prophet said he would. And, uh, but where is he from? He's from everlasting. But when you get to Colossians chapter 1, it says in verse 15, it says, speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. So the question comes up, and it, it does, especially if you deal with the cults, especially like the Jehovah Witnesses, uh, they do not believe that Jesus Christ is eternal God. They believe he's a created God, as if you could have another God other than the true God, but their belief is that he is a created God, and he's not, they're not the only ones that teach something like that, uh, but that he is the first thing that God created in order uh, for creation to come about. And, uh, and so they said he's not God. In fact, when you get the book of Revelation, they'll, they try to point out uh, that he's the mighty God, but he's not the almighty God. And they keep playing things like that. And, uh, and they do have verses. I always understood that when I study the Bible, there are verses that you look at that someone could use to support their view. And, uh, and so you need to have an answer to what that is. Is he, as Colossians says, uh, the firstborn of every creature, or is he from everlasting? We got two opposing scriptures, so naturally if a, a Jehovah's Witness takes you to Colossians 1 and tries to prove to you that Jesus Christ is the first thing that God created, but he's a created being, he's not eternal God, and then you play ping pong with him and you say, yeah, but Micah chapter 5 and verse 2 says he's from everlasting. So then I call it spiritual ping pong. You just, you got a verse, I got a verse, and you just go back and forth. So uh, I thought, well, this, this time of year, and, and because we have spent two weeks, in, or three maybe, in Colossians chapter 1, that I thought, oh, this is the perfect time to deal with that question and to talk about verses that look like a seeming contradiction and which one, how are we supposed to interpret that? And, uh, and so th that's the question, uh, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ and is he God, as we know and understand that God is a trinity and, uh, and like even the first verse in the Bible. Well, before I say that, come over to John. Now Colossians we'll be coming back to. But John chapter 1. <clears throat> I started to quote to you Genesis 1, 1, but I was going to show you a verse in John chapter 1, and I don't need to quote both because they start the same. John 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now if you look at verse 14, who are we calling, you, know, you see a capital W on that, who is, who is the Word? Well, verse 14 says, And the Word was made flesh, and dwelt amongst us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So we're talking, the Word is the Lord Jesus Christ, and according to verse 1, He was God. 
Now, Jehovah's Witnesses change the wording and say he was a god. And then they tell you that they only believe in one God. So, I, you know, it, the, the problems they have. But if you keep reading after verse 1 of chapter 1, it says, The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. So, when they call Him the first of the creation of God, when the first thing that God created, we know that Jesus Christ is the Creator. When it says God created all things, Ephesians says God created all things by Jesus Christ. The, the person who created the material universe that we live in is the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's nothing made that he didn't make. So that means God didn't make Jesus Christ or create Jesus Christ so that he could create everything else. There's, that verse 3 says nothing has been created that he didn't create or nothing made that he didn't make. So you, you, you got this, these phrases that you need to deal with on, on how, the, how to compare these. Now, before I even go back to Colossians, one time talking to a Jehovah Witness, he was trying to point out to me that Jesus Christ is the first thing that God created, and he took me to Proverbs chapter 8. So go there. I never heard Proverbs chapter 8 used the way that he did, but I couldn't disagree with him of what Proverbs chapter 8 is talking about and how it's personified. You'll see there when you get there. <coughs> Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 1, it says, Doth not wisdom cry, and understanding put forth her voice? She standeth at, in the top of the high places by the way of the places of the path. She crieth at the gates, at the entry of the city, at the coming in, in at the doors. Now we're talking about wisdom, and it's talking about uh, wisdom as if it's a person. Of course, it's female in, in all of this, but uh, wisdom is a per person. And you can read in, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 24 that Jesus Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. So they try to point out that Jesus Christ is the wisdom of God, right? Okay, yeah. Then they take you over to verse... Oh, um, where do we want to start there? Verse 22. It says, The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his ways before the works of old. I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning, or ever the earth was. When there was no depths, I was brought forth. When there was no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth. While as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest uh, parts uh, of the dust of the, of the world, when he, uh, when he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he uh, set the compass upon the face of the deep, uh, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he gave up the sea, the, the decree, uh, that water should not pass his commandments, when he appointed the foundation of the earth, I was by him. So they, they, they point out that, the, that this supports the idea that Jesus Christ was the first thing that God brought forth. And, uh, and that since Jesus Christ is the wisdom of God, that, that he was brought forth and then created all things. And uh, the first time he, that someone did that to me, I'm thinking, well, I think it is talking about Jesus Christ. And uh, so I had to just kind of sit and think about that for a little bit. But, you know, sometimes when you're talking, you don't pay attention to what you're reading or what's being pointed out to you. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Go back up to verse 22. The Lord possessed, uh, possessed me in the beginning of his way. Oh, does God the Father have a beginning? <laughs> and then it says, before his works of old, I was set up from everlasting. Now that's Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, is it not? When you get down to, what is it, verse 28 there? Uh, 29. When he, when he gave the sea his decree that the water should not pass his commandments, when he appointed the founda found, fountains, foundations of the earth, then was I by him as one brought up with him. <laughs> There's a couple things there. 
I mean, when you read the passage from verse 22 to verse 30, Jesus Christ is there with God the Father all the time. Now, he was brought forth, and we know he was brought forth to identify with the creation. But even when you read all this, it sounds like God the Father is creating everything. But we know that God the Father created everything by Jesus Christ. And that from the beginning, Jesus Christ, from everlasting, is with the Father. So the very passage that they're trying to use to say that Jesus Christ is the first being that God created, and then he created everything else, uh, the very passage they're used to support that is actually teaching contrary to that. That Jesus Christ is, has been around as long as God the Father. Now there's something else about that. <laughs> and it hit me, when, it was after our conversation with the Jehovah Witness, I'm thinking, wait a minute. You don't think God had any wisdom until Jesus Christ was brought forth? <laughs> that, that's the implication. If Jesus Christ is wisdom, and, and then he brought forth wisdom, then God had no wisdom until he created Jesus Christ, and all of a sudden God had some wisdom. And it's just so contradictory to, to what the passage is teaching, and, uh, and, and so you realize that, that support uh, for this passage, saying that Jesus Christ is the first being that God created, he's a lesser God, and uh, is not true. He is equal with the Father. In Philippians chapter, uh, uh, chapter 2 says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Now when Satan, who was a created being, wanted to be equal, I want to be like the Most High, that was a sin. But it wasn't a sin for Jesus Christ because he was in the form of God. That, was, that means God is a spirit. But there came a time that Jesus Christ came forth from God the Father and came into human existence in a, in a physical body. And that's, you know, that's the time of year that we're celebrating. We call it the incarnation of Jesus Christ. But from, the, from everlasting... He was in the form of God, but at a certain time, he became part of the creation that he created himself. So, go back to Colossians chapter 1. Now this time I'm going to back up a little bit, and it's like where we started last week, because I, I was pointing out last week, God's... Um, I don't want to say his emotion, his, uh, his love for his son. Um, when it says, uh, it, well, verse 12 says, Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. Last week we were emphasizing at the 11 o'clock hour God's attitude toward his Son. We put up time chart and showed all time centers around the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God's dear son. And so you see the emphasis there about God's son. So when we start out in Colossians, especially if you back up into verse 12 like that, what we're talking about is the relationship of Jesus Christ to God the Father. Uh, and in that relationship, it says in verse, now in ver verse 14, the reason we're giving thanks, in whom, in Christ, uh, we... Uh, we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. But this one that we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, he's God's dear son. So in verse 15, we're describing the relationship of Jesus Christ with God the Father. So verse 15 starts out, who is the image of the invisible God. So when Jesus Christ came forth, he's the image of the invisible God. If you read that in, in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 there, he is, he is the express image of God. And when, when the Hebrews calls Jesus Christ the express image of God, uh, what we're talking about is uh, an express image is the idea of when you look in a mirror, you are seeing the express image of yourself. Uh, it's funny how, you know, what it, uh, vampires or something, when they look in a the mirror, they're not supposed to see themselves. Well, God is a spirit, right? And I don't want to relate him to a vampire. <laughs> but God is a spirit. And if he looked in a mirror, you know who, he, who would, the reflection would be? The Lord Jesus Christ. He is the image of the invisible God. That's who Jesus Christ is. He's God who became flesh and dwelt amongst us, and we beheld his glory. 
as it says. We would never be able, you know, there's, I don't want to get into that, but there's always the, the, the thought in the future about seeing God the Father. I don't think we'll ever see God the Father. I don't think we can see God the Father. I relate that, and now you read it in Revelation where you see God the Father on the throne and Jesus Christ rising out of the throne. But I think our relationship with God will always be in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the reason I say that is God the Father is omnipresent, is he not? He's everywhere present. How can your eyes bring in focus everywhere present? You can't. But God has given us an image of himself, an express image of the invisible God. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. He took on flesh and, and became part of that creation so that we can identify with God. And Jesus Christ is the one who we identify with. Now in verse 15, my point was, is that we see God, uh, Jesus Christ, in relationship to God, to the invisible God. But right after that, we see Jesus Christ in his relationship to creation. So again, verse 15, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Now why is Jesus Christ called the firstborn of every creature? Well, if you notice, the next verse begins with the word for. We're going to get an explanation why he's the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, all things were created by him and for him. And we were expressing the, how he want the, God the Father for him to have the, the preeminence, verse 19, that in him should all fullness dwell. But my point is, is that he is called the firstborn of every creature because he is the creator of all the creatures. You know, we, we have terms that we use and we understand, like when the President of the United States uh, gets elected uh, and is in that office, we call his wife the First Lady. Why? She the first American person that ever lived? No, she's preeminent above all other things, uh, other women in the sense that she's the President's wife. Hope oh, might switch someday and it'll be, <laughs> anyhow. <laughs> But uh, uh, the, the point is, is why is he called the firstborn, or the, excuse me, the firstborn of every creature? Is it because God created him? Now, there's two things about that. It didn't say anything about creation, did it? Firstborn of every creature. Well, who gave birth to him? If we're talking about he was born before everybody else. There was no Virgin Mary. There, <laughs> there was God, and he didn't born, he didn't bear Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ became the only begotten of the Father when Mary conceived, a virgin conceived of the Holy Ghost and brought forth the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. So when, the very, to read firstborn and think that he's the first created is a mistake right there. The second thing is, notice the present tense of verse 15. It says, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. We're not going back into the past. He is to this day the firstborn of every creature. That's his present position over creation. Why? Because he created it all. It's all made by him and it's all made for him. So he comes first above all creation. And, and so that's the emphasis that we have here in, in what, why Colossians is calling him the firstborn of every creature for he's the creator of everything. So he comes above and before all of creation. And, and that's why it says he created, they're all created by him and for him. He's above it all, uh, verse 17. He is before all things and by him all things consist. So it's not saying that Jesus Christ was the first being that God created and that he created everything else. It's talking about his preeminence over all of, all of creation. Now there's another passage they use. Come over with me. And it's important when you understand what Colossians is. Remember he's the head of all principalities, power, dominion, or as it says there, he created all things visible and invisible, whether it be thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers. All things were created by him or for him. Uh, and what we're talking about, like in verse 20, and having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. See, everything centers around Jesus Christ because even the beings of heaven were created by Jesus Christ. And the positions they have in the heavens were created by Jesus Christ. So now come over to Revelation chapter 1.
Oh, I had to leave Colossians too quick. <laughs> I knew this was going to be fast. I got to, if you can find Colossians, if not, I'll read it to you. <laughs> I stopped just short of the verse. I read you in verse 17 of Colossians 1. It says, And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. He is the head of the, uh, uh, of the, of the body, the church, who is the beginning. Oh, there we go. Not only is he the firstborn, now he's the beginning. But watch what it says. Who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. So when he calls him the firstborn, He's the firstborn from the dead. And why is he the firstborn from the dead? That in all things he might have preeminence. He wouldn't have a, a reconciled heaven and wouldn't have a reconciled earth if Jesus didn't die on the cross, pay for our sins, and rise from the dead so that he could be preeminent in all things. But when we talk about him being the firstborn, it's firstborn from the dead. He was... He was born 4,000 years into human history. You know how many people were born before him, physically, before he was born of Mary? But he's the firstborn from the dead. He's the first to be raised in a resurrected, glorified body. So now, I got you in Revelation chapter 1. We're introduced to the Lord Jesus Christ. It says in verse 5, he's the one who's given the revelation. It says, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, of the princes of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God, even the Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he, uh, behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him, even so, uh, even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is, which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. He's from the past, he's in the present, he's in the future. But he's the beginning of the end, the beginning of the end of all creation. He, he's the one who began the creation, he's the one that's going to bring creation to its conclusion. And in the process of bringing everything to his conclusion, he again is called the firstborn, or the first begotten of the dead. Not only is he begotten, the only begotten son of God through Mary, but he's the first begotten in the sense that he's the first to rise from the dead to become part of a, a new species of humanity. Come over to chapter 3, Revelation. Because the, the Jehovah's Witnesses love this one. Each one, these, there are seven letters written to seven different assemblies, Jewish assemblies in Asia. So we start in verse 14. I think this is the, was this the last one? Yes. So it says in verse 14, And unto the angel of the church of Laodicea write these things, saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art uh, neither cold nor hot. I would that they were either cold or hot. Just take in verse 14, the beginning of the of the creation of God. Now when it calls them the beginning of the creation of God, are we talking about the first thing that God created way back in eternity past? Or are you reading the book of Revelation and looking to what God is accomplishing through Jesus Christ, the beginning that of, of the creation of God is if he's the firstborn from the dead, the first begotten from the dead, that Jesus Christ is the first of a new order of species of beings that are going to exist in eternity future. And there's going to be a new beginning at the end of the book of Revelation. There's a new heaven and new earth and new occupants, and there's not going to be any more sin. Because what we're talking about, Jesus Christ being the beginning of the creation of God, he's talking about the beginning of what God is creating out of humanity that the book of Revelation is bringing to its conclusion. And he's not, we're not going into the past, we're talking about what God's accomplishing for the future. And Jesus Christ is the first one raised in a glorified body. And someday when we get raised from the dead, we're going to have a body like unto his glorious body. And Jesus Christ is the beginning of that. And that's what that is about. 
So whether you can convince a Jehovah Witness about those things or not, uh, but uh, I thought uh, I'd just share those verses with you and realize the ping pong game that goes on, that you ought to have an answer to every man that asks you the reason of the hope that's in you. So that was the bell already, so let's pray. <laughs> our God and our Father, we do thank you for our class today. We thank you that even the question and answer times to realize that we all study our Bible and, and any time you study the Bible, there's gonna be questions. And so Father, we thank you that we have this Sunday school hour this week and again next week and have in the past uh, opportunities to deal with some of the questions that come up. And I pray that in what we accomplish today, that we might understand a little more clearly about the Trinity, but also about the incarnation of your son and what all that encompasses. And that is the beginning of a new creation that we're a part of when we trust Jesus Christ as our Savior. Bless the fellowship time to follow. In Christ's name, amen.